Uh, okay, so uh, we want to move into uh, a question, folks. Um, do you know anybody, or what do you think of somebody who parks their car, leaves the keys in the car, let's say um, on the dashboard, leaves the car doors open, and then goes in the house. You live in a busy downtown area where lots of people come driving by and walking by on the sidewalk. You have a working car and you've left the keys in the car and the car is unlocked. The keys are clearly on display on the dashboard as you walk by. You can see them. Are you guilty if someone steals your car? What are you guilty of? You're guilty of reporting your car as stolen. Or not. How do you view this? One view is, um, this is my car. I bought it, I put it here, and then I took off all my clothes and I uh, ran naked down the street and I had nowhere to put my keys so I just left them there and I'm going to come back in an hour and, um, you know, put my clothes back on and then uh, get in the car and drive away. What am I guilty of? Well, in most cities you would be guilty of um, public nudity. Is there a law that says that you must lock your car and you must take your keys with you. Not to my knowledge in my city, no. It's not a law that you have to do that. If you report that car stolen, let's say for a moment that an extraterrestrial just beamed onto planet Earth just, you know, like 10 feet in front of your car. They just beam down there and lo and behold, there's an Earthmobile. It's unlocked and there's keys to get it going. You as an extraterrestrial, um, that's perfect. I need to go someplace and here's an Earth vehicle that's ready to go. Would that extraterrestrial be guilty of, um, stealing that car? What was their intention? Their intention was just to go for a ride. They just arrived on Earth and, um, you know, the Tourist Bureau just didn't show up at the same time and say, okay, this is what's going on. No, you just arrived on planet Earth and um, you're just like a, a one-day-old baby who was just born into planet Earth. What does that baby know about Earth? Nothing. There's no owner's manual. The baby has an instinct to breathe, to drink milk. Let's put it. So it would seem that 
you have got to spend quite a lot of time learning earth ways. You need a trusted guide to um, launch you into this weird way that things are on planet Earth. You know, pretty much you got to be 18 years of old before you're declared, okay, I think you've had enough basic education on the way things work, run, are done on planet Earth that you can, you know, be declared an independent person. So what are we going to do when the extraterrestrials start arriving en masse? Are we going to like say, okay, for 18 years, you're going to have to be like a, an infant human? And, you know, you can hang out with you people somewhere else while you learn the ways of Earth? Or are they just going to be like, they're just going to beam down, you know, like right next to me sitting here on the bench. Uh, someone's just going to beam there. Because that's what they did on Star Trek. You know, Star Trek, the original series, 1967. The humans were beaming into other people's worlds in that city, in that city. So, um, what's to stop someone from beaming here? Why? Do you think that it's science fiction, this beaming in? Um... Anyways, this is what we have to face. Do our ways make sense? Or are they controlling factors from control freaks who want to control everything? I just gave you the answer. So if we're going to go to what we sometimes call, but let's go with uh, 7D. So uh, the fifth dimension was talked about in the song Age of Aquarius by the band Fifth Dimension in about 1969. And that was the way things were in the fifth dimension where they were trying to get us to go. Well, that was a long time ago. And now uh, we want you to consider even more advanced dimensions. So I gave you 7D. In 7D, just so you know, people can beam in and out of your reality. So the examples we have, again, are Star Trek. And the other example is um, I Dream of Genie, which was also in the late 1960s, where a genie could just like blink or whatever they just wanted something to happen and physical reality would change in accordance and we also had bewitched uh so samantha was a witch and she could do um the same thing that i dream of genie so genies and witches have the same abilities they don't need technology to do what they do they do it all through their own consciousness. But um, advanced humans, you know, several hundred years in advance of us, um, like, you know, uh, Captain Kirk, Captain Picard, etc., those humans don't have these abilities through their conscious mind. They have to use a technology to beam into my reality. But I dream of Genie, the Genie, or Samantha the Witch, um, they could just do it with their own mind, let's say. Heart and mind, perhaps. Now, these are just fictional ideas. Because I'm a Muggles. I'm Harry Potter's uncle. And, and magic is... Um, there's no such thing as magic. Anything that appears to be magic would be a technology. To a muggles because the muggles can't you know the muggles can watch star trek and go okay i can see that some gizmo that beams me from here to there you know it's an advancement on an elevator like you know, elevators in our 
buildings. And I do remember in like um, popular science magazine or, you know, something like that on the internet, they said that in a lab, maybe at MIT or CERN, that they could move one atom, I don't know, like 15 centimeters by teleportation. That was many years ago. So it seems like um, it's feasible to move an atom by teleporting. So, you know, you just have to spend enough money and develop the idea and you should be able to take all the atoms in my body and teleport them using a technology just like what they did at MIT. So for a muggles kind of person, it's like, it's doable. I mean, I haven't seen one of these teleportation devices being sold at Walmart or on Amazon. So they're being hidden from us. It's the same old story, you know, I gotta put my tin hat on and then you call me a conspiracy theorist, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. This technology has to exist somewhere in the universe. Because the idea came to us muggles in 1967 via Star Trek and via uh, this witch game or the genie game. So, uh, and you know, that's just television. The spiritual teachings of Jesus, you know, which was very common in Western countries, uh, was that Jesus could turn water into wine and they didn't talk about a machine that did it. Jesus did it. And in, you know, the religions of India, you had uh, advanced yogis that could do these kind of things as well. And, you know, if you read the old Sanskrit stories from thousands of years ago, uh, apparently they had spaceships thousands of years ago. And today on my feed, apparently Graham Hancock who was the author that wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, uh, he was going to talk about the South American Nazca Lines, enormous um, lines drawn on the desert floor in South America. I've not been to South America, so I don't know if they actually exist or it's a hoax. I'm trying to think if I've been anywhere where one of these unexplainable things has been shown to me. Like, I, I have not been to see the pyramids in Egypt. I'm trying to think if I've seen anything that is, looks like it was like man-made, but it was really advanced. like. These Nazca Lines. Why the Nazca Lines? Well, the story of the Nazca Lines is that um, it was a very primitive population of people when these things were discovered. And they were discovered when um, either hot air balloons were invented or uh, biplanes. Because in order to see the Nazca Lines, you got to be way up in the air. Because they're so enormous that you've got to get a good amount of distance from them. And they're, they're not close to a mountaintop that you can, you know, go to the top of the mountain and look down and see them. It's a vast plain. P-L-A-I-N. Flat land. And enormous pictures are drawn there. And the people were too primitive when, you know, these things were discovered. The people did not have hot air balloons or biplanes. There was no way for the existing people, when these things were found in South America, the existing people didn't have the technology to get up in the air and see that there were actually lines on this plane. So this is old, old stuff. Anyway, there's new information from Grain Hancock. I haven't read the article, but uh, I'm sure you could find it if you uh, went looking for Graham Hancock and Nazca Lines, N-A-Z-C-A, -A, Nazca Lines. So, 
I don't know if I have to keep beating this dead horse that these technologies exist and they're being withheld from us. Well, maybe it's somebody on a planet at like three galaxies over that's got these technologies. Nobody in our galaxy has got these technologies. Uh, so, you know, don't get butthurt over it. I mean, it's just that you're so far away from the beings, of the people that have this technology that, you know, they're not keeping track of you. Um, they're not even aware that you exist. And, you know, they're doing all their beaming somewhere else. It doesn't fit. Because somebody on planet Earth came up with these ideas about teleportation, teleportation devices. And witches and genies that appear to do these things without the technologies. I mean... I mean, looking across the river there, my high school used to be there. It was torn down and a new building was put up. But I went to high school in that physical location and across the river there. And did we talk about teleportation devices? No. Did we talk about time travel? Yes, I think we might have in physics. We might have talked about time travel when it came to Albert Einstein and relativity. How much time did we spend on it? Um, let's say um, one to two lectures touched on it. Out of all the days that I went to that high school, Anybody else talk about it? Um, yes, in English class, we read a book. It was Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels, and it was written hundreds of years ago. But Swift put his hero, Gulliver, in a place where the other people were like teeny tiny people about that big. So he used kind of fantasy to put us into other areas, but I'm going to call that an advanced technology to make it real. Is it possible to make people small and people big? I mean, uh, some of the stories on the internet are that there were let's put it slash are giant physical humans and there's teeny tiny ones how tiny can you get before you're too tiny to function I don't know I don't want to go too far down this pathway so did I agree to having all this information withheld from me, or is there some obligation on other people to teach me things that I don't know? I don't know. I'd love to know, you know, the backstory of what was going on before I was born. For me. Because, you know, all these stories about reincarnation or whatever, um, I'm inclined to believe them. But as far as the memory wipe and the complete memory block on what was happening to me before Earth, I mean, theoretically, I came from, from like the egg of my mother. So why is it that I don't have the memories of my mother? Why is it, you know, that the physical egg cell that became this body can make new memories, I and mean, there's new memories going on in my mind anyway. Why is it that, you know, I can't remember what my mother went through? Because theoretically, I was a cell in her body for her whole life up to the point where I was delivered. No, I have no access to her memories or my grandmother's memories 
etc. If we don't have those memories, shouldn't we? Shouldn't those memories come along? Because we were part of that thing? Put it that way. I mean, the cells that make up you are daughter cells from your mother. Why don't you remember what was going on? You don't. The answer is a big mystery. So memories are either blocked or they never did come along with the cells that came from your mother. The cell that came from your mother. It became cells. It became, you know, a little baby that was born. But, I mean, her mind travels around with her body. My mind travels around with this body. So, maybe it is that the memories of the mind are not stored in the physical body. And I remember only that we touched on this idea of where memories are um, stored. Um, biology books from, you know, the high school over there maybe. Or maybe, you know, when I went to university. But that was one theory that they were trying to track down and there was various weird evidences and I can't remember too much about it other than an experiment with a very primitive organism it was like a flat worm and they use this worm because if you cut it in half um, the two halves would regrow the missing halves so if you cut one of these kind of uh, organisms in two you would end up with two um, fully functioning organisms and they're trying to figure out if you did this experiment um, did both of these new worms have the memories of the old worms and I can't remember and how would you really tell I mean these worms are they really that intelligence that they can form a memory anyways If those memories of your mother are not stored in the physical body, then um, why are we so worried about the death of the physical body? Because the memories are stored somewhere else. And, you know, and someone that you consider your friend or your family member, what are you identifying with them? It's the mind and the body And the mind is pretty much, you know, the memories and whatever actions are done with the memories and the new sensations of the world as it is, moment to moment. In Star Trek, they called these things engrams. And you can watch the episode of the original Star Trek, the original series. Uh, it was called... The ultimate computer, where a computer took the engrams of its creator, Dr. Daystrom, and that's what the computer personality was all based upon. Engrams of the creator, computer scientist, Dr. Daystrom. So if the engrams of you and your friends and family are not stored in the physical body, then, you know, this big worry and fear that we have about oh my god, I've got a dead body on my hands and it's a friend or a family and there's a horrible feeling we have that we've lost a person um, I'm giving you, like, uplifting news the person has not disappeared if the body um, drops dead the memories are stored somewhere other than the body so you just got to figure out where that is and don't be a Debbie Downer and said, if the body dies, then, 
you know, the memory storage device dies at the same time. Because you don't have that memory storage device. So making that assumption is stupid. And I don't like stupid. So, you know, if you're missing your loved ones because they've apparently died, um, I want you to take it as an indication from this talk that they still exist. And then I want you to watch another episode of original Star Trek. It's an episode where the humans come to a planet and they discover rather primitive humans living there. I mean, the humans living there, they live in, um, let's say houses that might not even have electricity. So, I don't know, something from like the 1700s. And they're wearing robes, you know, they look like they might have come out of a Jesus story. They're wearing like sandals and robes. So, um, Captain Kirk thinks they're, you know, they're humans, but they're primitive. They haven't developed space travel. And I don't know, it looks like they've even de developed like a internal combustion engine cars. But the truth of the matter is, um, this is spoiler alert. You have to go look on the original Star Trek for an episode starring the Organians. It's very frustrating when the people who write the script won't give me the episode name. Like they should give it to me right now so I can tell you. Because there's a big gaping gap of the name of this episode. And there, it's not coming to my. The episode is, I, it's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. All the words that are coming out are not that episode. Why is that? Somebody's fucking with me. Is it giving me this frustration feeling? Because I'm feeling like I owe you the name of this episode. But anyway, the Organians um, have the ability to manifest a body for Captain Kirk to to see. And then they showed us on the show the ability to demanifest a physical body. And what happened was uh, the physical body kind of turned into like bright white light and then it disappeared. And Captain Kirk was like, oh, that's so weird. And actually at the time, you know, we're just learning Star Trek and I was about, I watched them on reruns. So let's say I was about eight years old when I saw original Star Trek. And I didn't get the whole thing. It took me you make, decades and decades before this dawned on me. But uh, what the Organians did, they phased out into light that, you know, Captain Kirk was like, what the hell? Well, that's exactly the way that um, Captain Kirk phased out if they used the transporter device. So, so why were things so much different with the Organians and Captain Kirk? Uh, the Organians could uh, change physical matter. So Captain Kirk was holding like a hand phaser or something. They could, uh, the Organians could break this or melt it down. Um, well, and Star Trek, the next generation, where they had replicators, they could, um, you know, replicate anything. How much more advanced is a replicator than one of our 3D printers that we have now? Um, quite a bit. It's just that they just made such a big deal about these Organians, who basically did the, did the same thing that Captain Kirk did. And they were calling these Organians, like, way more advanced than Captain Kirk or something. And that was what they told us, and we never had thought about it until, like, 40 years later. It's like, mm, i got to revisit this episode to see, you know, the logic behind why. Anyways, the episode is uh, Star Trek, uh, the original series. It was an episode where uh, the Federation was also dealing with 
Klingons. The Organians uh, created a spoiler alert peace treaty between the um, Klingons and the Federation. They were gaining in peace treaty, but in later episodes of Star Trek, it was pretty much um, ignored.